Welcome to that good sports. I am Brandon. The only thing longer and more disgusting than Ben Roethlisberger's beard is the year 2020 Perna. Wait, wait, he shaved it? Why? Why would he shave that filthy thing? All right, well, Joe Burrow may become the savior of the Bengals franchise. Lamar Jackson and the Ravens offense is set, but I think their defense might be even better. The jury is still out on Baker Mayfield, as is the jury trying to decide if Miles Garrett tried to murder Mason Rudolph. The AFC North has the potential to be the most competitive division in football if Big Ben is healthy and actually ready to play. So today, I will break down the draft and free agency moves for all of the AFC North and tell you who I think is primed to win that division. That's good. Sports. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. I do football news videos pretty much most days of the week here. I do have Big Dick Patreon shout outs for new patrons. Seth Stern, who I talked to during our Zoom conference of High Mountain Security LTD. He is offering private security and concealed carry instruction via Skype and Zoom. So check him out if you're into that. We've got Devo, Travis Bauman, charter member of the BioRef Foundation, Chris Hansen, Matthew Pond, Lucas Tangney, Jason Schaefer upping to $8, Nessie, Jace Cook, AKA Herschel Skywalker, Anthony Newell, The Price is Wide Right, Michael Piz, Coleman Gagnon, Garrett Friday do be kinda cute though, Austin T. Jones upping to $20, Jason Tayo, who's a Dan Marino fan, $5.13 donation, Barry Galler, Killa B, the barber of Erie PA, Alex Guerra, hire me to make your app at Dark Cloud Media with a big $50 donation. I'm assuming he makes apps at Dark Cloud Media and Blue Ridge Mountain Plumbing upping to $70 for all of your plumbing needs in Central Virginia. That was a lot of shout outs to make up for. I'm sorry I got behind because the last week has been crazy, but thank you guys, patreon.com slash that's good sports. That's how you support this channel. <laughs> All right, starting with the Stillers. During Mike Tomlin's greatest coaching performance to date, the team finished 8-8 eight and, eight and nearly snuck into the playoffs. Considering Roethlisberger's elbow lasted about the same amount of time as your standard rom-com, Blitzberg overperformed in 2019. Don't forget that D led the league in sacks with 54 and was second with 20 interceptions. Now some of their key agent free agent, <laughs> some of their key free agent losses and signings. The Steelers were able to pick up Eric Ebron to replace Nick Vanette, a tight end who went to Denver. But most importantly, they signed Derek Watt to make TJ Watt less homesick and patiently wait for JJ Watt to leave the Texans and join them in dangerous wattage, which would be cool if they all played for the Chargers. And their biggest loss in free agency was definitely Javon Hargrave, who signed a three-year deal with the Eagles. Now, no other splashy pickups for the Steelers, just depth to fill out the roster. The players they drafted, key players, Steelers spent their first round pick trading for Minka Fitzpatrick, which was definitely worth it. Then in the second round at 49, selected Chase Claypool, the big wide receiver out of Notre Dame. Later in the third, they took Alex Highsmith from Charlotte, who had 15 sacks last year as they tried to add another threat opposite TJ Watt. At pick 124, they went running back with Anthony McFarland Jr. out of Maryland. And no, that is not Seth nor Booger McFarland's son. And had they received the Polaroids of James Connors back, I'm not sure they would have taken a back in the draft. They also took a guard, Kevin Dotson, out of Louisiana to replace Ramon Foster, who retired this offseason. The big question for every team, do the Steelers still have a good QB? We really have no idea if Big Ben is healthy or any good still. He played only one and a half games last year, and he sure as hell sucked then. They addressed the position by doing nothing at all and hoping for the best, a strategy I mastered long ago. Mason Rudolph is dating someone and Duck Hodges is floating in a pond somewhere. And if either Mason or Duck is starting at quarterback, the Steelers season is 
over. Now the player I'll be watching in 2020 for the Steelers is going to be Juju Smith-Schuster. I wanna see if he can rebound from a down year. We were wondering if he could be a true number one after Antonio Brown left, but we didn't really see that happen. Now they did have a difficult situation at quarterback, but if Roethlisberger is healthy, then Juju Smith will have to produce. If not, will Deontay Johnson or the rookie Claypool be able to pick up the slack? I give the Steelers an overall off-season score of six out of 10 Big Ben beards. That thing was truly disgusting. Some might call it a bush. A <laughs> Devin Bush. I guarantee several birds were nesting in there and now those birds are homeless which is ironic as Ben no longer looks homeless. The Cincinnati Bengals finished two and 14. They had the worst record in the league, which is why they were able to draft Joe Burrow. Did you know that they got Joe Burrow? The Bengals, free agent, losses and signings. For one of the first times ever, the Bengals opened up the checkbook and decided to participate in free agency, grabbing guys like DJ Reader, who I really wanted the Broncos to take. Uh, two Vikings corners and Trey Waynes and Mackenzie Alexander, Saint Safety Von Bell, and they franchise tagged AJ Green for 18 million. Their two big losses, in my opinion, were Andy Dalton and Tyler Eifert, but Dalton was going to be a backup if he stayed, and Eifert is never a guarantee to be healthy. So basically, they lost two players who probably wouldn't have played. <laughs> their draft picks. The only pick that matters out of this draft is Joe Burrow. If he's as good as advertised, it was a good draft for the Bengals. They get an A. If not, it was a terrible draft and they will be ridiculed for it forever. After Joe Burrow, Cincinnati spent the 33rd overall pick on T Higgins. So first you get your quarterback and then someone to throw to, which is the reverse of when they took AJ Green and then Andy Dalton in the first two rounds in 2011. Between AJ Green, uh, Tyler Boyd, T Higgins, John Ross, and Auden Tate, who was the team's second leading receiver in terms of yards, Burrow should have success through the air. Tate is six foot five. Higgins and Green are six foot four. So I'm officially naming Cincinnati the Jump Ball Brethren. That is their nickname. After Higgins, they snagged two linebackers, Logan Wilson out of Wyoming and Akeem Davis Gaither from Appalachian State. So the Bengals really dipped into the pool of colleges competing for best redneck and most hillbilly. <laughs> Logan Wilson was the Bengals' number one rated linebacker on their big board, and he fills a giant hole on that defense, which was mostly holes in 2019. Hence why everyone called them the Shia LaBeoufs of the NFL. Maybe this year, they can all be honey boys. Anybody watch Shia LaBeouf movies? I don't because I have a hard time saying his name. Hopefully a healthy Jonah Williams makes a big impact for the Bengals on a line that was ranked bottom five last year. So do the Bengals have a good quarterback now? Well, they got the best available quarterback in the offseason, free agency, or rookie, in my opinion. Burrow had the greatest statistical season of any college quarterback ever and didn't lose a game in the process and looked cool as fuck when he won it all. What more do you want in a quarterback? Burrow, also from Ohio, has a better sense of humor than Andy Dalton, is more woke than most veteran QBs in the league, and would never let anyone as corny as J.J. Watt insult him. Bengals players I'll be watching in 2020, obviously we're gonna be watching Joe Burrow, but I want to see who will become his go-to target. Is AJ Green going to come back and look old or just as good as ever? Will T Higgins take a little while to adjust and will John Ross finally be able to stay healthy after the team declined his fifth year option? And can, and can Tyler Boyd churn out his third straight thousand yard season? The only thing that can stop the Bengals passing attack is their offensive line. Also, Zach Taylor will be in his second year as a head coach and he'll finally be able to legally purchase alcohol now that he is of age. So that should be helpful. Overall score for the Bengals offseason, 18 red rifles firing their last shot at the 21 BB gun salute. Then we've got the Cleveland Browns. After winning the title of offseason champions in 2019, the Browns proceeded to go just six and 10 in real games and then decided to remodel the entire freaking kitchen. Some of the key free agent losses and signings. Okay, regardless of what players they signed or lost, the biggest move of the offseason for Cleveland was moving on after one year of Freddie Kitchens and hiring Kevin Stefanski as their new head coach. Kitchens seemed like he was in over his head, which 
To be fair, probably wasn't all his fault. The Browns promoted him from quarterbacks coach to head coach in a span of under six months. As far as the players they brought in, Cleveland added Case Keenum, a fail safe at quarterback, Jack Conklin, a desperately needed addition to the offensive line, Austin Hooper, who will create a strong tight end attack with David Njoku, Andrew Sandejo, veteran experience at safety, Carl Joseph, and of course, 22 players in one, my beloved fullback Andy Janovich, the Manovich Jano, the opposite of a tree hugger. In fact, this is what tree trunks attacking tree trunks looks like. Now, Cleveland also said goodbye, goodbye to linebacker Joe Schobert, who went to Jacksonville to have a a chance to win. Uh, Schobert spent all offseason watching tape from the Jags 2017 playoff run thinking it was their current team. Uh, linebacker Christian Kierksey, a long tenured Brown but oft injured player who left for Green Bay. Guard Eric Cush, the dopest interior lineman ever went to Las Vegas. Now, I think this was a net upgrade for the Browns. They learned their lesson on splashy moves and became a more rounded roster rather than top heavy in terms of talent. We might as well put Miles Garrett on the key additions list since they will be getting him back on the field. Uh, I'm not sure if Joe Woods was the right guy to bring, bring in as defensive coordinator. He was not good in that role with the Denver Broncos and he had a ton of talent to work with there. Now this was a good draft for Cleveland. They shored up the tackle spot by picking uh, Wills to go opposite Conklin and then added playmaking ability on defense. Collectively, they got mostly A and B plus draft grades by all of the guys who will be wrong about the draft in three years. Again, started with Jedrick Wills out of Alabama, who they will most likely move to left tackle to try and decrease the 40 sacks they allowed last year. Uh, six of those sacks came in the final week against the Bengals. Now, in the second round, they landed safety Grant Delpit out of LSU, which was great value for a guy who was projected to go in the first round for a long time. That's two LSU defensive backs now with Greedy Williams in year two. So they should definitely have a beat on how to stop Joe Burrow since they practiced against him last season. Uh, a key pick could be Missouri defensive tackle Jordan Elliott to give the Browns some much needed depth on their defensive line. Then they double dipped in the third and grabbed another LSU Tiger, linebacker Jacob Phillips, clearly taking a page out of Mike Mayock's book by selecting as many players as you can from the best college uh, from the season before. But my favorite pick, of course, was their final pick in the sixth round in Michigan wide receiver Donovan People Jones. In the case of the People versus Donovan Jones, the judge has ruled in the favor of giving the Browns a winning record again. Case closed. Do they still have a good quarterback? This is the big question. Was 2019 a sophomore slump for Baker Mayfield, or is this the guy he is as opposed to when he won Rookie of the Year in 2018? Last season, Baker threw just 22 touchdowns, five fewer than the year before when he only played in 14 games, and he almost matched it with uh, 21 interceptions. He was still over seven yards per attempt, which is promising. It's also important to note that he ran the ball more effectively, five yards per carry and three touchdowns. I really think uh, he is a great fit for the offense Stefanski is going to deploy, which is based on a lot of boots and play action and should increase Baker's completion percentage significantly. Players I'll be watching in 2020. This team is going to go only where Baker Mayfield takes them but I'm curious to see whether he gets more help from Odell Beckham Jr. than he did a year ago, who apparently played the entire season with a torn penis muscle. Along with Drew Locke, I think Baker has no excuses not to succeed giving the skill position talent around him. Nick Chubb, a full year of Kareem Hunt, Landry, Beckham, and Joku, and now Hooper. That is a stacked roster, and I am curious to see if they will succeed with an offensive game plan every week instead of just some scribbled plays on the back of a Denny's menu written with Crayolas. Overall, offseason score for the Browns? Underrated. As much as I thought the Browns were overrated going into 2019, well, that's not true. Will thought that. I bought into the hype because I'm a sucker. I think they are now becoming underrated heading into 2020. Finally, we've got the Ravens. They finished 14 and two, 12 straight wins to end the regular season before losing quite convincingly to the Titans at home in the divisional round, or as I call it, finishing the season with little trust. Little trust. Their key losses and additions, uh, Baltimore could have done nothing 
and would still be my favorite to win this division. They reeled in the big fish in Calais Campbell and one of my favorite Denver Broncos, Derek Wolf, and then just recently reached a compromise with Matthew Judon to give Baltimore one of the best and most deep diverse defensive fronts in the league. They also brought back corner Jimmy Smith, which is a great third corner option to have uh, in, in the secondary with uh, Marcus Peters and Marlon Humphrey. Marshall Yonda's retirement is a big loss for the Ravens offensive line. Uh, they traded tight end Hayden Hurst to the Falcons, but have Mark Andrews coming off of a 10 touchdown season and the always reliable Nick Boyle to do the dirty work at tight end. Baltimore did a great job re-signing many contributing players, including center Matt Skura, Skira, Skura. They even got Pernell McPhee to come back on a team-friendly one-year deal. Collectively, they got A's for their draft across the board, a couple B's. So whatever Ozzy Newsom taught to the, the guys in the Ravens' front office is sticking. Now, after losing C.J. Mosley to the Jets last offseason uh, in free agency, Linebacker remained a position of need. Now, even though the Ravens only gave up the fifth fewest rushing yards in 2019, uh, Baltimore is in a Super Bowl window and at a point where they need to address the minuscule areas that need improvement. So they did that by taking linebacker Patrick Queen, who earned defensive MB MVP honors in the national championship game with their first pick. Uh, Queen is a smaller but quick linebacker that was brought in to stop the stretch run plays and cover tight ends and backs. Uh, running back J.K. Dobbins is a great uh, player to pair with Mark Ingram. Dobbins crossed the 1,000-yard mark all three seasons at Ohio State. At pick 71, Baltimore selected Justin Matabuke, who many consider a steal in the third. Plus, he's going to play behind Derek Wolf or Calais Campbell, so he's in a perfect position to succeed and come in on uh, rotation and make impact plays. Baltimore also added slot receiver uh, in the third round with Texas receiver Devin Duvernay. Four total picks in the third, including two depth pieces for the offensive line and too many additions throughout the entire draft to cover here. Uh, question, do they still have a good quarterback? Yeah, I think it's fair to say Lamar Jackson is not only a good quarterback, he's a top 10 QB and a top 10 running back in the NFL. That's not a Bill Polian type comment either. He's just really fucking good at both. Genuinely speaking, I have never enjoyed watching a non-Broncos quarterback play like I did watching Action Jackson last season. He led the league in passy tutties from the pocket and Harbaugh said he needs to make defenses pay even more when they stack the box this season. So look for a quarterback already dangerous from the pocket and in the red zone to get even better. Players I'm gonna be watching in 2020 for the Ravens, Earl Thomas, who we now know will only play man-to-man -man coverage if his family is involved. More seriously, it's Matthew Judon, who I think will feast and possibly compete for NFL sack leader with Derek Wolf locking down the end. Judon had nine and a half sacks last season and is in a contract year. Now, Von Miller will tell you himself a huge part of his success is due to Derek Wolf demanding attention and dominating at defensive end so he could air bend around the edge for sacks. If Judon is not top three in sacks by the end of this season. It's because he got hurt, Wolf got hurt, or the world ended. That's my bold prediction. I give the Ravens an off-season score of bigger trust. Bigger trust, I say. I think the Ravens are the division winners. I think the Steelers and Browns compete for that second spot, and the Bengals, who will definitely be better, probably need a season and some more defensive pieces to fight their way into contention and become a threat in the AFC North. Woo! That was a long one. Please subscribe here on YouTube. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, at Brandon Perna. If you want to follow me on those socials.